Hello, my name is Paul Frost and I'm a volunteer here at Long Pond Dye Works and I'm going to be your tour guide for the next hour and a half or so. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be touring an old company town. Uh, the purpose of the work at the company town was to produce iron. So there were mines and here is where the furnaces were. Uh, the reason we're all here in this particular spot today is because when the earth was formed, there was a natural deposit of iron ore that ran all the way from northwestern Massachusetts down through Connecticut, southern New York, northern New Jersey, and into Pennsylvania. Uh, it's known geologically as the Reading Prong, and uh, that is because it ends in Reading, Pennsylvania. And the prong is about 200 to 300 miles long, and on average about 25 miles wide. And like I said, it runs in a big band all the way from Massachusetts down to Pennsylvania. So all along this prong were furnaces. What happened was after New York City was settled in the 1600s, people were looking for ways to make money in the new land. So they came up the rivers, which were like the highways back then, into the interior of the country, looking for gold, silver, anything you know that could make money. Uh, they didn't find much gold and silver, but they found a lot of iron. And if you can produce a lot of iron in uh, this world, you can make a lot of money. So they set up furnaces all along this Reading Prong that I talked about. So Long Pond was started by this man, Peter Hassenklever, who was born in Germany, but became a naturalized British citizen. Uh, he came over uh, from England in 1765. Uh, he was part of a company called the American Company. Uh, he had two partners in Britain that stayed behind. And Peter Hassenklever had was a very grand thinker. He had uh, envisioned uh, a huge empire uh, here in the colonies. So not only did he do Long Pond, but he also started Ringwood Manor, ironworks there. And he had ironworks in uh, Charlottesburg, which is off by Route 23 and even went so far as to have a furnace, iron furnace, on the other side of the Hudson River in Cortland. So he had this big empire that he was trying to make. Unfortunately uh, for him and the American company, he, he was dealing with a wild country. There was no real infrastructure. There weren't a lot of good roads. There was no housing for his employees or for his enterprises, buildings. So he outlaid a huge amount of money. And this alarmed his partners back in England. They couldn't tell what was going on here being on the other side of the ocean. All they knew was he was spending a lot of money. So they called him back um, and accused him of overspending and malfeasance financially. And uh, he was replaced and he spent the rest of his life trying to defend his reputation. The man that replaced Peter Hassenklever was Robert Erskine. Robert Erskine was Scottish born uh, and uh, he learned a lot about the iron industry before coming over here. He was basically starting from scratch as far as knowing what to do with iron. And he came over and he took over in 1771. And he was the iron master in charge of Long Pond when the Revolutionary War started. And uh, because he was a right thinking man, he saw the uh, nature of what we were fighting for here, the future Americans. And he switched sides from being British becoming American, supporting the American cause. Uh, not only did he make iron, but he was also a very skilled map maker. This picture here is a copy of a map that George Washington carried on his person when he was in the area, and it was made by Erskine. Erskine made over uh, 300 maps uh, during the war. And as you can imagine, maps are very valuable to have when you're in a country that doesn't have a lot of main highways and roads, and nobody really knows where they are, unless you have maps. Now, unfortunately for Erskine, he died on a map-making expedition during the Revolutionary War. So the cause he was fighting for, he died during it. And because of that, uh, he's considered to be you know, an American hero. He died in the cause of freedom for America. Now, what happened in the iron industry is usually iron production was tied to wartime. When you have a war, there's lots of need for iron. And in between wars, there's enough iron out there where it can just be recycled and reused. So the curve for the iron industry goes up when there's a war, and then it falls off when it's not. 
And when there's not a war, in between wars, a lot of ironworks can't make enough money to continue. So they go up for sale. And they just go up for sale until somebody comes along and unfortunately another war starts. So what happened was uh, after the Revolutionary War and Erskine died, the iron industry lay fallow here. And it didn't pick up again until the War of 1812. And during the War of 1812, Wong Pond was bought by this man, Martin Ryerson and his family. And they ran it pretty successfully up until 1853. And in 1853, he sold, the Ryerson family sold to the last iron masters to operate Long Pond, the Cooper Hewitt family. Uh, the Cooper Hewitts were two men. Peter Cooper, the senior partner, is the famous um, New York citizen whose main claim to fame is Cooper Union, uh, the free school, one of the first free schools in the country, one of the first schools to admit women. It was really his, that was his main interest in life. He loved that school, Cooper Union which is at the head of the Bowery uh, in New York. His partner was Abram Hewitt. Now they had a familial relationship. Mr. Hewitt was Mr. Cooper's son-in-law. Mr. Hewitt married Mr. Cooper's daughter. So there were business partners and then father-in-law, son-in-law. And they operated uh, the ironworks during the most productive time of a long pond, which was the Civil War. That was our biggest uh, time. The thing we're probably most proud of here at Long Pond is the Capitol building. Local iron mines run by Cooper Hewitt supplied the iron ore that went in to make the Capitol Dome. The Capitol Dome was actually designed by Cooper Hewitt. And when you look at the Capitol Dome today under that white paint, a lot of people think it's wood under there, but it's not. It's actually an iron superstructure. And the ore for that dome came from our local mines. Okay, before we leave this room, the museum, I just want to point out that this museum is actually in an old worker's house from the Civil War era, from the Cooper Hewitt era. Uh, it's actually, it was a duplex. So where you see this cutout here, this was a solid wall and a family lived in each half of the house. Uh, you can see the indentation going along the top of the wall there, the side of the wall. That was where the second floor was. Uh, that would, upstairs would have been the sleeping quarters, and then down here would have been sort of everything else, your living room, your day room, where you would eat your meals. Now, during the uh, time that this was a house, during the Civil War, uh, in fact, all during the 1800s, parents had huge families. You had a lot of kids hoping, because there was a high child mortality rate, you had a lot of children hoping that a few would make it into adulthood. So typical families had maybe eight to 10 children, then you would have had the two parents. And then there was no social security net or any kind of safety protection for older people. So if you had an old uncle Jim that you wanted to take care of, it was up to you to provide for him. So believe it or not, in each half of this house, there could have been up to 12 to 15 people living, calling it home. Uh, now, besides this being like, you know, the sleeping quarters upstairs and the day room or the living room and the dining room down here, there would have been an attached kitchen on the back of this building, and there would have also for, uh, been outhouses for bathroom purposes. But still, eight, uh, 12 to 15 people in each house, in half of this house, sounds kind of severe, but you must remember that the housing was free. If you worked for the company, you were employed by the company, you got free housing, which would have been a big deal to people that didn't make much money in the first place. Also, a lot of times, it was be very rare for the house to be filled with all those people. During the day, all the men would be off working, and at night, there would be night shifts, so men would be working at night as well. And also, you know, with no electricity, women's work was a lot harder. Uh, women got up very early in the morning, worked all day long, and a lot of it was outside the house. So even though it sounds severe to us that there would have been 12 to 15 people living in such small spaces, uh, to them it was a good deal, basically. Okay, here we are outside in the parking lot of the Visitor Center Museum, in front of the building. And this building was actually built in three stages. As I said inside, this was a, a worker's house, and this was here by itself for about 60 years. 
And then what happened is in the 20s, after the 1920s, after the ironworks company left the town, they allowed all the people that worked for them to stay in their houses for free for the rest of their life. So that was great for them. They got to live here for free still. They didn't have to work for the ironworks, but they needed to come up with ways to make money. So what they decided to do, because this was a busy road even back then, is they decided to create um, a, basically a hamburger stand. And so in 1920, they built this, what we call the hyphen, this little short building, uh, to serve food to the public that were driving up and down this road. Uh, you didn't actually go inside. The windows folded down, and you ordered through the window what you wanted, your hamburgers, your drinks, hot dogs, simple, pretty simple fare, basic food. And in order to eat the food, you could either get back in your car and drive away to somewhere, or they actually had a picnic area behind the building uh, where you could eat uh, your lunch and hang out for the day. And in this picture that I'm holding, you can see um, umbrellas that they would, one of the umbrellas they would sit under. They had uh, fireplaces in the back. Uh, this is before this became the Monksville Reservoir. And before there was a reservoir, it was a very scenic, uh, locally famous river valley that ran through here. So it was, you could really easily spend a whole day here just enjoying nature and being out and having a picnic lunch. Well, this was so successful. Uh, they made a lot of money. They decided to add on this final third building over here. And this was like a country store, uh, like just like you would see in the old movies with the pickle barrel and old guys sitting around it playing checkers, the potbelly stove, the whole bit uh, back in the 1920s. It was also the post office. And if you wanted to go fishing, uh, it was still privately held land by the Cooper Hewitt, so you couldn't just do whatever you wanted for free. Uh, if you wanted to go fishing, you had to get a license. You had to pay a fee, basically, to go fishing. And this worked really well. Back in, when we're talking about in the 20s, the automobile was a relatively new thing. So Sunday drives were a big recreational activity, going for a drive in the country. So that enabled them to pull off a lot of traffic that is going by even today uh, to come and eat. Now, of course, today you can't buy any food here, which is just a museum and a visitor center. OK, here in the parking lot in front of the visitor center, we have this mound. And back when this visitor center was a restaurant and a country store, they actually had gas pumps on this mound. So not only could you get your food and hang out, you could also fuel up your car. Now, just to show you how prosperous the village was after the ironworks left, they built that church over there originally a Methodist church, in 1895. So that just shows you that even though the ironworks left and the main source of income for the people that lived here disappeared, they were able to carry on and have successful, fruitful lives, uh, so successful that they were able to afford to build a church. OK, here we are in what we call the Village Green. Uh, it's a big field with three houses. Two of the houses on this green, two of the three, were actually moved here from a different location. Only one of the houses was here from its beginning, its original construction. What happened was, is when they were going to create the Monksville Reservoir, which is behind us through these trees, they did, uh, there were some houses and there was actually a farm and other buildings in where the reservoir was going to flood out. So they hired an archaeology company to come in and analyze the houses and determine if any of them were old enough were significant enough to save. And two of the houses, it turned out, were. So when they, before they flooded the reservoir, they actually jacked up the houses onto big flatbed trucks, moved them down the road, East Shore Road, closed the road for the day, and drove them into this um, field where there was already pre-prepared stone foundations. And they just lowered the wooden parts of the houses onto the pre-prepared stone foundations. One of the houses that was moved was this house over here. This is known as the Patterson House, and it was built in 1780. So that's definitely old enough to be considered worthy of saving. The Patterson House here used to, before it was here, used to be on the other side of what we call the causeway, on this side of Greenwood Lake Turnpike. So it was back there, about, oh, almost a half a mile away, back there through those trees where the reservoir now is. Uh, it doesn't look like much now, but this house actually was part of a larger farm complex. Uh, they had stables where you could go and ride. 
um, after it became a private house in the uh, after it was a private house in the uh, let's see 1800s middle 1800s maybe after the Civil War it became a, became a commercial building uh, it was a restaurant it had many uh, names over the years uh, Holy Mackerel Paul Bunyan Inn the Wanakew Valley Inn uh, a few others that I don't remember at the, t at the moment. And uh, like I said, there were stables and you could just come here and stay, like spend a whole weekend or a week in the country, enjoying country life, uh, riding horses, fishing, a whole big thing. You can see how the door, the red door is actually raised up. That was because there was a wraparound porch that went around the house. So even now today, it looks like more like a barn. It actually did start out life as a house. Now over here, this is the house that was originally here since its construction. This is another Civil War era worker house, another duplex, just like the museum that we were in and that we saw in the parking lot. Uh, these are, those are the only two worker houses uh, still remaining. There was actually 11 originally and we only have two left. Uh, you can see it's a duplex, it's got the mirror image. If you draw a line up and down the middle, you can see on each side there's an equal amount of doors and windows. Duplexes were a lot cheaper to build for workers than individual houses. So a good way to know, if you're out in the country anywhere, a lot of times I've seen this in Pennsylvania, for instance, if you come about into a town where there's a lot of duplexes, especially a whole row of them, that usually means that there was, at one point, uh, it was a company town, that town that you're in. It's a good little clue to know when you're out and about, about how to find uh, former industrial sites like Long Pond, other old company towns. Okay, here we are in front of the third house on the Village Green, but before I go any further talking about these particular houses, I just want to say that in general, if you come to Long Pond and visit us, which we hope you will do, the only building that you can go into as a visitor is the museum and the visitor center that we saw in the very beginning. All the other houses on the site are closed to visitors. And that's because as an all-volunteer organization, we have, a lot, we have a lot of trouble raising money. Uh, none of us, we're all volunteers, none of us are expert fundraisers. So all we can do, afford to do as a group, is to preserve the in outsides, the exteriors, to keep the houses weatherproof. And that leaves no money left over to do anything with the inside. So if you were to go in any of these houses, you would just see a very bare situation. Uh, a lot of times it's only framing, some of the houses are actually unsafe to enter. They're so bad inside. So I just want to let people know that if they do come to Long Pond, the only buildings you can expect to go into are the Visitor Center Museum. Now this house specifically, which is known as the Rittenauer House, was actually built in three sections. The first section is the section between the chimneys, which was built in 1810. Then the second section that was built was this side over here, which was built in 1830. And then finally, in 1870, this section over here was built. Now, this house started out like the Patterson House as a private residence, but then in order to, for the, as part of the need for the people to make money that lived here after the ironworks left, just like the Patterson House was turned into a, a little mini resort, this house became an antique store. The owners, in order to make their money to live, ran an antique store out of this house. Okay, so when this was a company town in Ironworks run by Iron Masters, uh, there would have been about, on average, about 250 people living in the village. Uh, there was over 110 buildings. Nowadays, nobody lives here, it's a state park, and there's only 11 buildings left. So we have one-tenth of the original buildings that were here. And we'll be seeing most of those buildings today on the tour. Now behind me was a school. Back where these bushes and weeds were was this building here, which was a one-room schoolhouse where all the grades were in one room. I don't know how that worked, but somehow it did work. It was quite common. And it was really interesting because Cooper Hewitt, both of them were progressive Democrats, very liberal, uh, very concerned about the welfare of their workers. So not only did they offer free housing, they also had rudimentary medical care, and they also provided free schooling, which was really kind of remarkable back then for the children of the iron workers. The only hitch to this was there were no child labor laws. So if your family needed as money, couldn't produce, the parents couldn't produce enough income to run the household, they would have their children working. There was no age limit. I don't know how young they would be, but I assume almost as soon as they could walk, if it was necessary, they would be put to work. The male children would be in extremely dangerous conditions in mines, 
being gophers for the furnace workers, uh, whatever they could have, do to make money for the family. And for the girls, as I said in the museum, women's work was extremely difficult uh, back then before electricity. So women, girls were needed to fetch water and just to generally help their mothers with the cooking and the cleaning, which as I said, went on literally from before dawn into after dusk. But if your parents were well off enough or could survive without you working, you would definitely pay to have your children in a school. Uh, that way your children may be able to break the cycle of being you know, workers in a mine for generations. Your children may be able to gain an education and move out of this uh, situation onto better things. Okay, here we are on the other side of the road from the barn complex in front of the oldest building on the site, this stone building back here. This building was built in 1771. So again, right about when Erskine came, we were still a British colony. There was no United States of America yet. We were four years away from the beginning of the Revolutionary War. And uh, it was built, as you can see now, as a worker's house. Again, it has that duplex effect where if you drew a line up and down in the center, there's an equal amount of windows and doors on each half of the house. The thing is originally, because it's, such a, it's a stone house, it's made out of stone, it's a lot bigger than the other worker houses that we've seen, we think this building actually started out as a commercial building. Uh, to put such effort into constructing this building, it was probably meant to be used for uh, the profit of the company, not as for somebody to live in. Now over here behind the house, there's, uh, you can't see it because it's so overgrown, but there's a stream. Now back when we're talking about in the 1700s and the early 1800s, water was the main source of power. Any water source, like a stream or a lake that was lead, feeding into a river, would be dammed. And then the water flow out of the dam would be controlled to run something, usually a mill. Now, you would have needed a lot of lumber to build the houses here. So we think, uh, it's a theory only, but we believe that there was a sawmill back here during the Revolutionary War times and this building that is now a worker house was originally some kind of building connected to the sawmill, maybe a storage for the cut lumber, maybe an office for the people that worked at the sawmill. But uh, the evidence would point to the fact that it was commercial uh, and then later on became um, probably a very solid high-end worker house. So it wouldn't have been for regular workers, it would have been for upper management or middle management of the ironworks company to live in. Okay, here we are in the center of town, center of the Long Pond Ironworks Village, and uh, it's kind of, to the knowing eye, you can kind of see why it's called the center of town. All the roads sort of converge here. Uh, we have two roads coming in on this side here. We have a road coming in down here from the left, and then around the corner here, there's roads that one goes this way, and one goes this way up the hill. So you have uh, five roads that meet right here. And that's kind of why we've determined that it was the center of town. It's where everything came together. Now I'm standing in front of an old picture of what was the company store. Uh, the picture's kind of dirty now. It's been out here for a couple years and it's not been cleaned. But you can kind of see how the store would have looked just right after the company left. Uh, this photograph is taken around 1900. And behind me, you can see an old ruin that's in really bad shape. Well, these are the same building. Uh, the company store was uh, the sort of center of town. It's where, if you were living here, you came to buy whatever you would need that you couldn't produce at home, whatever you couldn't grow in your garden, food-wise, whatever you couldn't make, uh, like pots and pans and maybe clothing, if you weren't that skilled of a clothing maker, uh, you would come here to buy. Uh, I always kind of joke on my tours that whatever we go to the mall for today, those big malls like Willowbrook Mall or Westfield Center in Paramus, uh, the people back then had just this. And they didn't even have the whole building. The top of the building, the top floor of the building, was the accounting offices, the management offices for the ironworks. So the company store was just the main floor, the ground floor and the basement for storage. 
Uh, so people were very limited, obviously, in what they could buy. Uh, there was also other options. Like I said, you could make stuff at home or grow your own food. Also, uh, the town was visited periodically by traveling peddlers uh, with wagons, and they had a lot of stuff uh, that they could would sell you to use in your home. Uh, if you worked for a company back then in the 1800s, uh, most of the time you did not get paid hard cash. You got paid something that was called company script, money that was only worth anything within the, town, uh, the company. If you tried to go out of the bounds of the company and spend, try to spend the money in local stores in uh, you know, other towns, they wouldn't take it. It was worthless. Uh, it was basically monopoly money. Uh, this is one of the ways that they kept people tied here to the company. Uh, what would happen is if you showed up here looking for work and they were always looking to replace people because it was a very dangerous occupation. It was one of the most dangerous occupations you can imagine working in an iron furnace. People were always getting hurt and even killed. Uh, so there was a constant turnover of employees. Uh, if you arrived here with your family with just the clothing on your back and you wanted a job, they'd give you a job, they'd set you up in a house, right? And they would even give you credit to buy things to help you get your household going. So what would happen is you would start out your life here in debt to the company. And because you were only paid company script and not even that much uh, in terms of monetary value to the company, you would be in debt basically the whole time you worked, basically for your whole life. It was theoretically possible that you would be in debt to the company for your whole life. Uh, if you got tired of that or wanted to break away from that and ran and left the town owing them money, they would actually hire bounty hunters to come get you. They would put ads in papers to hire people to come and get you and bring you back uh, because you owed them money. So if you've ever heard the old song, a lot of people know about this, there's an old song called 16 Tons which actually talks about uh, coal mining in Pennsylvania, but it would apply here as well. And that would be the fact that you sold your soul to the company store. It's a line in that song, 16 tons. Okay, here we are just a further bit along in the actual geographical center of the town. And up on the hill up there, through all the trees, you can see a ruin. Well, believe it or not, that ruin used to be known as the nicest house in town. And it used to look like this. This was the on-site manager's house. You know, the people I talked about in the museum, Haas and Clever, Erskine, Ryerson, the Cooper Hewitts, they didn't live here in the town. They lived over at Ringwood Manor. That was their big house. They very rarely came down to their ironworks. They relied on uh, their immediate uh, below them in the chain of command, a man named P.R. George for the Hewitts. During the Hewitt era, uh, there was a man named P.R. George who reported directly to the Hewitts. And he lived over in the Ringwood Borough, what's now the Ringwood Borough Hall. Now, P.R. George, he was sort of in charge of all the ironworks. Like I said in the museum, all the men I talked about in there, they didn't own just one. You know, they didn't just own Long Pond. Most of them also owned Ringwood Manor. Uh, Mr. Ryerson, he owned Pompton Furnace down by what's now the Pompton Falls. Um, Erskine and Haas and Clever owned Charlottesburg and over in Cortland. So there was a lot of ironworks and other enterprises that these big money men owned that needed to be, you know, all the reports from them, these uh, different areas of their empire needed to be correlated and delivered, you know, in cohesive reports to them. So P.R. George, who would be in charge of all the other enterprises, uh, his, the guy who reported to him from Long Pond, who was in charge of Long Pond during the Cooper Ewood era anyway, his name was George Cunningham. And Mr. Cunningham and his family lived up here on the hill in this house, which I said was called the nicest house in town. And it was really quite beautiful at the time. It's uh, a falling down wreck now. We're just too far gone for us to try to save, which is a shame. But his wife was into agriculture, I mean horticulture. And she had, you know, all kinds of rare trees and bushes that she got imported from other places, planted around it. And it was really quite nice. Now, while we're talking about the houses, this house and the other houses, one of the things we're noted by the Smithsonian Institution of America down in Washington, D.C., we're noted for two things that are unique. One of them is we have a level of housing for every level of employee in the company. We have the big house, which was owned where the owners of the company lived, Ringwood Manor. Then we have the immediate successor to them, which is P.R. George. He lived in Ringwood Borough Hall. Then we have the on-site manager's house, which is up here, and then we have the individual worker houses. So we have a level of housing for each 
level of employment in the company, all the way from the big guy up to the littlest guy. And that's unique, uh, especially on the East Coast. That's a rare thing to find, and we're recognized by the Smithsonian for that. Okay, here I am next to the weigh scale. It's across from the company store. And of course, any material going into the village to be sold, or anything leaving the village, like iron products, to be sold elsewhere, needed to be weighed so they could determine the value. So that's what the function of the weigh scale was, which of course, conveniently, was right across from the company offices. The way it worked was, there was a spring loaded, it's just like today, some things never change, and the technology for this weigh scale that was built in use over 150 years ago is still the same. There was a spring loaded platform, you drove your vehicle, usually in these, those old days, an uh, ox cart filled with, say, uh, iron ore that was coming to the, be melted down to make iron. You would drive the cart full of iron ore onto the uh, spring-loaded scale. They would weigh the cart, the oxen, everything, you know, the full thing, note that weight, and then after the uh, load had been dumped, they would weigh the empty cart. And then the difference between the full cart and the empty cart would be obviously how much uh, you delivered. And this is exactly what happens today when you go to a junkyard, say your pickup is filled with scrap metal, you drive your pickup onto the spring-loaded scale, they weigh it full, you dump your load, and then they weigh your empty pickup truck, and the difference is exactly uh, the worth of what you brought. Okay, here I am in front of the ice house at Long Pond, the structure here. Now again, I keep saying it, but again, there was no electricity back then, so there was no refrigeration as we know it today. What you had was an ice box. They called it an ice box. And that was kind of looks like today's modern refrigerator. There were two compartments. There was an upper compartment lined with tin that you stuck a big ice block into that you would buy. And that ice block would cool the food that was in the space below. Uh, if you look at a lot of the old 1950 TV shows, the um, Honeymooners is a good example. In Ralph and Alice's apartment, if you look in the background, some of the shots in the apartment, you can see an ice box in the corner back there. Now these ice boxes obviously needed ice. So what would happen is during the winter, any source of water that froze solid, like a lake, would be, uh, har the ice would be harvested. They would go out and they would cut blocks of ice from the lake in the winter. They would bring it to ice houses like this. They would put it in a structure, like I said, like this ice house. The uh, blocks would be stacked in between layers of straw to keep the blocks from melting together. The structure itself would be built into a hillside to keep it cool, anything to make the building cool. So it would be lower in the ground, almost like a sub-basement, and it would have a grass roof, uh, dirt roof over the top to help everything to gear to help keep it cool. And what would happen here in Long Pond is you would go to the company store, you would give them money, you would pay for your block of ice, usually a block would last about a week. Uh, you'd pay for your block of ice, it wasn't free, and then you would come here and you would get your block of ice. Okay, here we are on the platform that overlooks the Colonial Furnace, and this is where I talk about how iron was actually made. So iron, as a finished product, the first thing that happens is it's mined from a mine. And what comes out of the mine is called iron ore. Iron ore is iron, pure iron, mixed in with other ingredients. Dirt, other minerals like granite, sulfur. So what the whole purpose of an iron furnace is to separate all the junk from the iron and leave just pure iron. So here we have a cutaway view of a colonial era furnace. A cutaway view, for those that don't know, this is showing the interior of the furnace, but normally it would be four-sided wall. You wouldn't be able to see in like you do in this picture. Now what would happen is there were three ingredients that were used in making iron. Iron ore from mines, charcoal from burned up trees, or yeah, trees turned into charcoal, and limestone. Those are the three ingredients. Uh, the limestone acted as a fluxing agent. It made the operation inside the furnace, which is called the Bosch, run more smoothly, keep everything melted evenly and not clumping up. And also this uh, limestone acted as like a sponge and it would suck out the impurities from the iron ore. So these three ingredients, iron ore, charcoal, and limestone, would be stored on buildings on the bank above the furnace, which would be behind you now. And as they were needed, they would be loaded into wheelbarrows and they would be pushed across a wooden bridge called a charging bridge. Furnaces were loaded from the top into what's called the throat. 
So wheelbarrows, like in this picture, this guy looks like it's uh, limestone because it's white. They would push the ingredients in a wheelbarrow across this charging bridge, which was over there, and would, they would load it into the throat. And then um, just having charcoal set on fire wouldn't be hot enough to melt iron ore. Iron ore melts at a minimum of 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. So in order to get it that hot, they would have forced air, which came from two bellows. There were two bellows because when one bellow was pushing in air to the furnace, the other was sucking air in so it could blow on its turn. So it would be like a constant whoosh, 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 whoosh of bellows, leather bellows, going into what's called the tie air. And that's another archway. That's the archway where the air would be forced into the furnace. Now, the bellows were leather and they needed to be protected. So there would be a wooden building, uh, a wooden structure like a shed over the bellows. Now to operate the bellows, there was a water wheel. The water wheel turned a camshaft and on the camshaft were bumps. So as the camshaft revolved around, the bumps would raise and lower the bellows so they could operate that way. The water for the water wheel came, in this case, from a dam on the Wanakew River 400 yards upstream where the elevation was suitable enough to run a raceway down the side of the hill to the furnace to turn the water wheel. Now when the iron master determined that the, enough iron had melted to do a pour, they would prepare a sand bed in what was called the casting house. Again, another building with a roof over it because the casting house had a sand bed in it and it was about two feet thick, the sand bed, and it would be kept the exact right consistency of moisture so that it could hold the shape. Just like when you go to the uh, beach and you build a sand castle above the sand, in a casting house, they would build patterns below the level of the sand. And in the most common pattern was this pattern here that we see in the picture. One long trough with little troughs coming off it. Now, it reminded the workers of a mother pig laying on her side feeding her baby pigs. So that's where the term pig iron comes from. Pig iron are these little short bits and the long piece or the long trench was called sow iron because that's the name of a female pig. So what would happen is usually every 12 hours it would take from one end to the other. They would knock out a clay plug in the bottom of the Bosch. They would have a prepared sand bed the molten iron would flow into this pattern, fill it up. Now, it had to be, like I said, exact right consistency of sand and moisture, because if the sand was too wet, it would be just like throwing bacon in a frying pan where you get little splatter, except in this case, the splatter would be these little iron balls. So if you can just imagine standing in a closed space uh, with little iron balls shooting around inside. That's why all iron workers usually were dressed head to toe in leather. And even with this leather protection head to toe, they would lose arms, they would lose eyes, they'd get hurt in the leg from scattering little pellets of iron that would shoot around inside. So that's one of the reasons why iron making was one of the most dangerous occupations you could do. Now you see here this puddle. I don't know exactly why they did it like this. This is a puddle of slag. Slag floated above the molted iron. It's just like when you make a turkey soup or a chicken soup the fat, which is lighter, floats to the top. Well, that's what happened with slag. Slag is a term for all the waste product that a furnace would produce. Slag would float to the top and there would be a plug hole much higher up than this. And then uh, when they thought it was enough time to drain the slag, they would knock out that plug hole and the slag would put like this. Now, slag was a real annoyance to the iron makers. Slag had no known use. And being men in business, this drove them crazy to be producing something that could not make a profit on. But there was just, they could never figure out a way to use it. So what they did was they made it use it for landfill, basically. So when you go to a furnace area, you'll usually see piles and piles of slag, which is uh, either a glassy, because it has a lot of sand in it, or is pumicey, like uh, people call it moon rock sometimes. And you'll see that scattered all about, and this place is no exception. A larger majority of the land you walk on here is actually landfill from slag. There was as much slag produced as iron. Okay, so in this layout that I've just explained about how iron is made, and we're looking down in the colonial furnace setup, the charging bridge that I talked about where they wheeled the ingredients across to the top of the furnace left from the hillside here. The furnace that you're seeing now with the tarp on it, that's very deteriorated from its original condition. Originally the furnace was 25 feet high 
So it would have been even with the top of this hill, or maybe even just a little bit higher than the top of the hill. Now it's been greatly reduced. So it was roughly about twice as high, the furnace originally, than you see today. The bellows house, the housing for the, that protected the leather bellows, was just below us on the hillside, on this side of the furnace that you see tarped. The water wheel that operated the bellows was on the far side to the, uh, to the left of the furnace. The casting house was on top of this stone foundation that you can barely see sticking up through the weeds. Under those weeds is the two-foot sand bed still today from colonial era times. Now again, if you were here back when the furnace was operating, you would not be looking down at like exactly this. There would be the roofed building of the bellows house, and there'd be the roof building of the casting house, and the furnace sort of sticking up in the middle of all this with a wooden charging bridge, much like the one I just showed you in the picture, coming off the top here. Okay, here we are in front of what I consider the most impressive structure at Long Pond. It's called the Unfinished Water Wheel Pit. What happened was by the 1880s, the whole country of America had been pretty much mapped out. Everybody knew where all the resources were. And what happened was they found a huge iron deposit in the upper Midwest, Michigan, Minnesota. Uh, and these iron deposits, instead of being in the mountainous regions like they are here, were in the plains, in flat area. So it was a lot cheaper to transport ore from the mines to the furnaces than it was here in the Northeast with all these mountains. So what happened was the Northeast iron makers couldn't, uh, couldn't compete with the Midwestern iron makers financially. So one by one, they either, the Northeast guys, our guys, either moved out West and continued their business out there or they just went out of business here and went into other areas or retired. So Long Pond, they decided to stay. Mr. Cooper, Mr. Hewitt, the men I talked about in the museum, they were true New Yorkers. They lived in New York. Peter Cooper, as I said, had Cooper Union, which he spent every day of at, hanging out. He loved that place, it was his baby. Mr. Hewitt was actually the mayor of New York City in the 1880s for a term. Uh, he served on a lot of government committees. Uh, his children were in Mrs. Astor's 400, which was an exclusive social club during the Gilded Age. So those families, the Cooper Hewitt family, they didn't want to move out to the middle of the boondocks in the Midwest. They were going to stay here even if they couldn't do iron. But before they gave up, they tried everything they could to maximize the profits of their site. Now, they had two Civil War era furnaces, they had two Civil War furnaces going. Each furnace that they had had a water wheel, which are down there, which we're going to see next after we leave here. They figured it would be more cost effective instead of having two separate wheels to maintain if they built one big wheel. And that's what this pit was going to be. The uh, ratio of power produced by a water wheel depends on its size. So the bigger the water wheel, the more power it produced. So if you had two 25-foot water wheels for two furnaces and you wanted to replace them, you needed to build one 50-foot wheel. So that's what this wheel pit was going to be. It was going to house a 50-foot water wheel, which looked like a, pretty much like a big Ferris wheel in there. It would have been really impressive. Uh, but unfortunately, at some point, we believe the accountant sat down the Cooper Hewitts and said, look, guys, no matter what you do here, you're just not going to be able to compete with the men in the Midwest. So this water wheel pit was just stopped. Construction was just stopped midway, and it was never finished. You can actually see they never even cleared, finished clearing out the pit. There's a pile of rocks on the side ready to be removed. The water wheel itself, the wooden wheel, was never put in place. But if it had, and this had all been come to fruition, instead of a raceway here that you see going under this bridge for the two 25-foot water wheels, there was going to be a huge, like almost like a canal size, probably 12 feet wide raceway, which would have been also huge, that they actually started construction of on the top of the hill. And if you come here at some other time in the future to explore this place on your own and you go up this hill behind the water wheel pit, you'll come to this huge, almost canal-like raceway that also was never completed uh, to feed this water wheel.
Okay, here we are between the two Civil War era water wheels. And you can see they look very different in their situation, in their condition. What happened was, uh, when they decided to abandon the water wheel pit project of the big 50-foot wheel and go back to just using these two, or continue using these two, they thought, well, we might as well rebuild them. So right before the ironworks company gave up and left the site, they built two brand new water wheels that were barely used when they left. So what happened was these wheels sat here, uh, this white covering, this is a modern thing that we did in the 1980s. Uh, so before that, these wheels just sat out in the open, to exposed to the elements. So obviously they gradually started to deteriorate, but not too badly. They were in really good condition up until 1957. And in 1957, we have a local news report saying both wheels got burned. Uh, we're not sure why it happened. There's various theories. One theory is that there were some people here partying and picnicking, and they set candles up on the spokes of the wheels, and it got out of control and burned the wheels. Another theory is that the wheels were burned in order to try to remove the uh, valuable iron scrap metal from the wheels. We're just not sure, but the point is that up until 1957, for over almost 100 years, these wheels sat here minding their own business until they burned. So what we did was we, we got a grant when we first opened up in the 1980s as a public park. We got a grant from the New Jersey state government and part of the money went to reconstructing one of the wheels. There was enough left of the wheels to determine exactly what they would have looked like when they were new. So we used those uh, configurations to make a new wheel, a brand new wheel. So this wheel over here to my right was built in 1984 and is an exact recreation of the wheel that it used to be. This one we left in its original burned condition just to show an original wheel. Uh, we thought it would be good to leave at least one. And the thing is now, these are the only two, or this one now, is the only original water wheel connected with an ironworks in the Northeast. So it's a very significant, uh, even though it doesn't look like much, it's a very significant ruin. Now these uh, wheels, would have been in one big building. They wouldn't have been out in the open like this. They needed to be protected from the elements. So if we were here back when the ironworks was in business, we would be standing inside a big uh, sort of a barn. There would have been two rooms with a corridor. So there would have been a room for this water wheel. You can see the foundation going around it. Then there would have been a corridor to go between the two wheels. And then another building for this wheel. And you can see that foundation here in the ground. Okay, here we are in front of one of the Civil War, or what's left of one of the Civil War furnaces, and this is where I like to talk about what could go wrong. Now, what would happen is you're loading a furnace up with all these ingredients. You really can't see inside. This is a cutaway view, remember. This would be all closed up. You couldn't look down the throat because so much heat would be coming out of it. So the value of a good iron master was that he could tell what was going on inside the furnace by experience, and all his sense, a sense of smell, sense of sound, he could hear what was happening. And, uh, but basically, they were pretty much blind to what was going on inside. So what would happen is you're dumping all this stuff in without knowing how it was going, really, except by experience and sense of things. What would happen is a bit of unmelted iron would get stuck in a crack of a brick. The Bosch, where all this action took place, was lined with high quality brick called fire brick that was meant to withstand high temperature. But like all brickwork, there would be cracks in between the layers of the bricks. So what would happen is an unmelted piece of iron ore would get stuck in one of the cracks and they wouldn't be able to know this was happening. So as they continued to load the furnace with more material, layers would form around the stuck piece of iron until it swelled up so large that it would choke off what they call the throat. And once that happened, you had to shut everything down because nothing would go down the throat anymore. Nothing would go down or melt. So you had to cease operation, shut down everything. You had to wait for the furnace to cool, which took up to two weeks to happen. Meanwhile, your workers are sitting around idly, pretty much. Nothing's getting made. And then once the furnace cooled, you would have to just brick by brick and stone by stone dismantle the furnace from the top down until you got to wherever the piece of stuck ore was. Now because this thing inside that got stuck seemed to grow with the layers and layers making it bigger and bigger, 
they thought of it almost as a living thing, and they compared it to a salamander. It's a lizard, and it's early stages of a lizard's development. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but they turn a bright red, almost like a fire orangey red. So they called this stuck piece of material that grew up to choke off the throat a salamander. And that was the bane of their existence because you would lose almost a month time removing the salamander and getting back into operation. Well, they didn't look on these salamanders very kindly. They just wanted to get them out of the way, push them out of the way, uh, far enough away so that they could go back to work. So in the case of this furnace, which is right on the edge of the Wanakee River, they just pushed the fur uh, salamanders into the river right here. And right now, even with all this overgrowth, you can see at least two, three salamanders sitting uh, here in the riverbank. They're solid iron. They weigh almost as much as a car. They ton weigh tons. And um, they were a big pain in the neck to the furnace uh, operators. OK, here we are standing between the two Civil War era furnaces, the one I was just talking about with the salamanders over here and the other one over here. This one here was built in 1861, and this one was built in 1865. So they were built four years apart. This was the first one. I have here a picture taken in 1894. So this was taken approximately 10 years after the ironworks left. Unfortunately, we don't have any photographs of, uh, I actually know of no photographs anywhere of furnaces anywhere in operation during uh, the 1800s. Unfortunately, yeah, no photographers or even a lot of painters decided not to paint furnaces. But anyway, you can see here in the photo what at least this one looked like before it fell down. Had a charging bridge, a really long charging bridge, really elaborate setup on top by the throat. Back here, you can see the uh, covering for the water wheels, the barn I talked about that housed the water wheels. Now. This furnace obviously looks a lot different than it does today. What happened was we believe that after the ironworks left, you could actually, when furnaces were in operation, you could actually walk around. They had a corridor around the outer ring inside. So you could actually kind of walk into a furnace in order to do repairs and you know maintenance. So what we think happened was after the ironworks company left, but the residents remained in their homes, anytime they needed bricks, for a sidewalk or maybe to shore up their foundation or to build a fire pit. They would come down here to the furnace, go inside it, and brick by brick, you know, as they needed them, would remove bricks from the inside of the furnace. Well, this is a lot like removing the skeleton from a body. If you have no skeleton to support the body, it's gonna collapse. And that's what we think happened in this case. They just removed so many bricks that it got to a point where the structure couldn't support itself and it caved in. Now also, so that's why they look so different. Now also in this photo, you can see a pipe and it's kind of hard to see, but at the very top of the photo, the pipe ends. So it was about a hundred foot pipe because these furn this furnace was 60 feet high. So that's 60 feet. And then there's a, probably another 40 feet high to this pipe. Well, what this pipe is about is they discovered that if they pre cooked or baked the ore in a separate structure before they put it in a furnace, it would reduce the possibility of getting a salamander. The problem was the material that they would bake off, most of it was toxic. There was sulfur, I know, was one of the ingredients that was common to find with iron ore. So in order to vent these toxic gases from the baking process, they built a huge pipe so that it would be high enough so that the fumes, the quite harmful fumes, would be high enough, expelled high enough into the sky where they wouldn't affect the workers uh, going down. And you can actually see in the back there a piece of pipe laying on the ground there. It's in the bushes. That's actually part of this stack from when it collapsed. Now, if you look at this side, this furnace, the 1861 furnace, you can see that it pretty much looks the same. It's a squat, cut down structure. Well, what happened is another one of the cost saving or efforts to increase uh, the profit, like the big water wheel that never got finished, they were working um, up until 1870. These two furnaces were operating on charcoal, the process that the Colonial Furnace used for fuel. Well, by 1870, the railroads had come into the area and they were able to bring coal from Pennsylvania. And coal is a lot more efficient, burned hotter. It was just all around a better thing to use than charcoal. But you can't just take 
furnaces that were built for charcoal and instantly overnight use coal. There's a different sort of technology involved. So what they had to do was they had to rebuild the furnaces. So what they did was they cut down both furnaces to the size this one is now with the intention of rebuilding both of them for coal. But unfortunately, because of the uh, problems they were having uh, making a profit on the iron, they never rebuilt this furnace. So that's why in this photo taken uh, 10 years after the ironworks left, you have one completely good built furnace working, or was working, and one that was never rebuilt uh, and was just left in its cut down state. Okay, here we are on Furnace Road, just down the road from the furnace area, which we just left. And here's where I'm gonna talk about charcoal as a fuel, which is really a, quite an interesting thing. Uh, in the early days, up until the Civil War era, of iron making, what was used for fuel was burned up trees basically, which is turned into charcoal. This whole charcoal making process was an industry into itself really. Uh, it was the lowest ladder rung of the employment in the company. There were more charcoal makers who were known as colliers in employ of the company. They were the largest number of employees in the company. And what they did was they would be out in the surrounding hills. They wouldn't be really, per se, at the furnace area. They would be out in the surrounding mountains. They would set up a little camp and they would cut down trees uh, and they would make little mounds like this. Stack the trees in sort of a pyramid with a hollow center and a hole at the top. And then they would cover the mound with leaves and dirt. And the idea was you would go in to, inside the mound in the cleared out space inside and you would build a fire and the fire, the heat of the fire, would cook the moisture out of the trees until they turned into crumbly charcoal, kind of almost like what we use as briquettes in our barbecues. The thing was, you had to keep a 24-hour watch on these mounds because, first of all, to convert the cut trees into charcoal, it took about six weeks of the process. The other thing was, so it was, took a long time, the other thing was you had to watch the fire because if a gust of wind came along in the right direction and, 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 and you know, ignited the fire even hotter, it could start a fire and you would burn, instead of cooking the trees to charcoal, you would burn the trees to ash. So what happened was you had men, called colliers, living out in the countryside with usually two or three mounds in a semicircle, and then they would have a hut, a very primitive hut like you see here, in the center of the semicircle, and there would always be at least two men because one had to be awake at all times, even in the middle of the night, because you had to be worried about a sudden flare up of the, of the fire burning the trees instead of cooking them. So this is a typical Collier's hut, uh, very primitive. Like I said, they were the lowest paid workers. They were the bottom of the ladder in the company. And uh, there would be set, set, um, setups like this all around the area. You can see in this picture, in the background, how there's no trees, or it kind of looks like winter. But really, this could have been taken at any time of the year, even in the dead of spring or summer, when there's usually plenty of green. But you can see in the picture how there is no green. Not only were trees needed for fuel for charcoal, but for lumber and all, all kinds of various uses. Roads used to be planked with wooden boards. So trees were a valuable resource, and wherever they could be harvested, they were. So nowadays, today, in the 21st century, you look around in a park like this and you see plenty of greenery, lots of greenery. But if you notice, there's no really big fat old trees. The only really big old trees you see today are what, on private estates that have been in private hands for centuries, or a lot of times in the center of a town, you would see a, you'll see an old tree. That's because those trees, the old ones you see today, they would be guarded and cared for and prevented uh, they would prevent colliers from coming along and cutting them down for wood. Um, so it's really interesting now when you go to parks or even now when you are in North Jersey, for instance, and you see lush greenery everywhere. Back uh, 120 years ago, that was not the case. Most places that you would go in this area would be completely barren, almost like a desert landscape. And um, it was not a pretty thing. And maybe that's why today we don't really know, most people don't know that this was the situation. Okay, here we are in what we call the barn complex. And back when this was a going village from pre-USA times, back in what we call the colonial era, all the way up until the 1900s, 
the company that operated here needed to, of course, feed all the people. As I said, up in the Village Green, it was up to 250 people they had to feed. So what they did was they contracted out to local farmers, either exclusively or just as you know, part of the farm's regular business, to supply produce and food, other food items, to the town. Now that needed to be brought to a central place so then it could then be distributed to individual families in the village. So all that food from the surrounding farms was brought here to this field that you see behind me. There was, I've, um, when it was a farm, what we call the farm complex, there was a lot more buildings. Today we only have one structure left, but there are remains of other buildings that were here that are in this photo. You see this barn here. This was the livestock barn. Uh, this is again a before you know cars and any kind of motors, gasoline engines. So all the things that we use cars for, transportation, etc., hauling, was done by animals, what called draft animals, horses and mules and oxen. Well, these draft animals needed a place to stay. And that was where this came into play here. This was the livestock barn. The bottom floor of the barn was where the animals lived in stalls. And then the top floor of the barn was where they stored all the hay and the other fodder to feed the animals. Now this barn was back there. If you see, you can see a uh, stone rubble in the back there, sort of a pit, it's kind of overgrown. But back there, that's where this barn was. Now back here, Another pile of rocks way back there at the back of the uh, green, uh, the farm complex area, behind those trees, you can see some stone piled up. That was this. It was a blacksmith shop. Um, you know, they would shoe the oxen and the animals that needed uh, horseshoes or shoes, mule shoes. And also they could do minor metal fabrication like nails, hinges, hooks. Uh, again, when the ironworks left, in the 1880s and people needed to make money, the eventually what was used to be the blacksmith shop became an auto repair shop. Uh, you could bring your car here and get it fixed. Uh, and in fact, if you go back there now, there's old car parts buried in the ground. There's a rear axle. There used to be an engine block buried in the ground from when it was an auto repair shop. Now finally, over here, we have uh, the only building that's really still standing. And again, this is another building that was moved. Uh, this building used to actually stand on a nearby road called Westbrook Road by what's known as the KOA campground. It was right at the edge of the road and it was considered to be dangerous. The road curved right in front of it. Cars used to hit it. And the township decided, the township of West Milford decided to uh, tear down the building and scrap it. Well, we heard about that. We went to investigate how historical it was, and we found out it was made of post and beam construction, which basically means it was made in the 1890s. No nails were used. It's all pegs, wooden pegs and stuff. So we decided to save it. And what we did was we uh, took the framing of the building and moved it here and reconstructed it and then went out to a lumber yard that specializes in selling old uh, lumber, uh, distressed lumber, for if you want to make your barn look old, which is what we wanted to do. So. The cladding on the outside of the barn is new. Uh, it's the interior structure of the barn that's old. And we moved the barn here to sort of represent it being a farm complex.